Well, good morning, hello, and good day to everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of our Friday Fundamentals. My name is Steve, and I thank you for joining me today. Today, I'm going to uh, giving you a, a brief overview of SoftPlan, covering the basic principles and concepts of drawing a house within SoftPlan, and I hope to include the use of uh, floor system levels to do a split level. We'll do a front back split in our little house uh, example that we'll be doing today. And that will demonstrate the importance of what we call adding a reference point, making sure our uh, floor plans stack together nicely when viewing in a 3D. I also want to touch upon hopefully layers and building options and the difference between the two and develop a site plan with some slope and terrain within that site. So to begin, when you first start saw plan, you come to the start page, which is the page beyond. To create a new project, you would click create a new project or click here to start. And it brings up this new project dialog. I filled out the information, but basically you're going to give the name of the project in the first field at the top. The name of the drawing will automatically build, uh, be filled in. It'll be called main floor. The program will automatically generate a 3D tab and soft list tab. Soft list is the material um, uh, report. So we're going to keep those open so we can demonstrate what those are. And the rest of the information, you obviously would fill that out relative to the project at hand. Filling that information out here will allow that information to be repeated in other aspects of the drawing or the project, namely that is we create what we call a plan set or construction documents, that client information gets repeated within the title block of your construction documents. So have that filled out, we'll hit okay. And this creates the new project. It's gonna create three tabs across the top as you see there. The first one is the main floor. We then have a 3D texture tab and a materials report called standard complete. First thing I want to do is maybe give a brief tour of the soft plan screen. Across the top, we have the menu bar, file, draw, erase. Currently the draw menu is active. If you need a different command, you obviously select it. And the menu bar, the large icons underneath will update to reflect the tools within the menu that you've chosen. There's also a toolbar. These can be customized, add or removed or even specialized. Uh, sorry, customized here to add or remove tools that you uh, use more often. There are other options here called a status bar, building and layer controls, and something called a drawing mode. Depending on the size of your screen and how much real estate you have, you may want to reorganize these menu bars. First thing I'm going to do is reorganize the status bar. To do so, you can poise your cursor on top of the leading dots, the left edge of any bar. And as you hold down your um, left mouse button, you can drag that bar to a second row or a first row in this case. If you, That just gives me more real estate. Again, these status bar will update with information. I need to give my computer screen enough room to display all that information. To start off by drawing our simple house, so we're gonna be drawing a bungalow house. It will have a main floor. There'll be a split to it. The back will be raised up about a foot and then we'll have a full basement underneath. To start off by drawing the main floor, we come to draw and wall. In this case, we're gonna start off with the two by six board and batten wall. Sopland is a object oriented program, meaning we're gonna draw a series of objects. The first object here, yes, is gonna be our wall. And as we draw these objects, they do things or interact with other objects around them. Second wall will we draw will automatically join with the first wall etc. Dimensions will automatically start up here with an auto dimension. Before you start the first wall, again, taking note of the status bar, now giving me the name of the current function, draw a wall, and there's a tape measure. That will reset at zero once I click to start the wall, and I can rely on that tape measure to guesstimate 
the length of wall. Another concept of Sopland is that of sketch edit. You sketch out the layout of your floor plan. And then once that is uh, laid out, you then go back and edit dimensions to firm up the building perimeter, the building footprint. So I'll click here. My tape measure reset to zero. I'll sketch that back wall about 30 feet. Left click to end. Now the first wall we draw, being a surfaced wall or a board and batten on one side, we need to indicate where that surface side falls on. Putting my cursor down, the board and batten will fall below the wall. Leaving my cursor up, the board and batten will fall above the wall. I want it to be on the top side. I'll click. That's where the wall has now been orientated. And I can continue sketching the remaining perimeter walls, 50 feet. And end where I started. So once we've got a, a series of walls drawn, you also notice that this program has automatically added some dimensions. Currently, those dimensions are hard to see. They are adequate for a typical quarter inch print, but if I want to rely on them to make sure my building perimeter is accurately measured, I'm gonna turn on something called enlarge dimension numbers. Now I use the keyboard shortcut to turn that on. That was control Q. Alternatively, options and enlarge dimension numbers can also be used to do the same. This artificially enlarges the dimension numbers so you can more accurately see what they currently are. In order to gain accuracy of my floor plan, if I wanted 30 feet left to right in a 50 foot deep building, I edit those dimensions. So my next task then is to grab the edit command. I can do so from the edit menu, edit item, or find the same in the toolbar. Once that has been your active or current command, simply left click on the dimension digit and it will ask you to input a new value. We'll say 30 feet to enter feet and inches. In Soplin, you can use the foot and inch mark or the quote and single quote, but you can also on the full keyboard layout, the number pad on the far right, the minus is feet, plus is minus, or sorry, minus is feet, plus is inches. So 30 minus gives me 30 feet, and then I indicate the direction of which I want that wall to move or more specifically, the adjust. If I go to the right, that will adjust the right end to make up my 30 foot. I continue with the same logic all the way around, although I can do something called predictive editing. Rather than click on the actual dimension digit, I can click on the end of the dimension line that I want to adjust. So I'm gonna to click towards the bottom of the dimension line. The move automatically predicts what I'm going to do. So it's the down arrow button. That's where I want it to go. So all I need to do is punch in the distance, 50 feet or five zero minus, and then hit enter twice. And it will automatically adjust the end of that dimension. Coming to our 3D point of view, we can see that the program has automatically started to create a 3D view of our exterior walls. And it is also generating a material report in the background. Back in my main floor plan to add the interior walls, we come back to draw wall. I'll grab a three and a half inch partition. And like the exterior walls, I'm just going to sketch those in where approximately they need to go. Once I got my rooms laid out, we'll go back and add more dimensions through the interior and then edit those dimensions. To add the interior dimensions, though, there's no automatic method. We do though manually by clicking on the dimension menu and clicking on the dimension tool or finding the same tool within the toolbar. You also notice that once a command has been activated, if that command also has an icon in the toolbar, it will be highlighted or in this case, outlined in blue. And then to add our dimensions, if we put our cursor within a room, the program has some predictive dimensioning here as well. The one currently more bold than the other will be the dimension value that will be uh, drawn 
if I double click. If I come to another room and I want the other dimension, I simply click once and move in the direction I want that dimension to follow. That gives me a dimension for one room, but if I want to dimension the full building, ideally I can click on the outside, drag my cursor all the way through, and click again. And this will dimension all the way through the building. I'll repeat that for those that I've missed so far. Start here, come to the outside. and get the closets dimension. So now that I have those dimensions in place, the interior dimensions with the enlarged dimension numbers on looks a little crowded. So I can turn that off again, hitting control Q. Brings the dimension back to their normal sizes. And then we edit the interior dimensions to suit. Again, we found our, our find our edit command. And I'm gonna to continue to use the predictive editing I want that to be 23 feet, enter twice, it will move down. This room needs to be 15 feet. I wanna make sure I move the partition so my cursor is closer to the partition, 15 feet, enter twice. And I can continue doing that all the way through. Two feet for the closet, that leaves the 11 foot six for the final room. Seven feet down, this 11 foot eight is adequate because I set my 23 feet here. I want three foot six to give me a hallway. Well, that lays out my interior dimension, uh, interior walls. I can come back to 3D and update and see the update that's been done here. Back in the 2D point of view, the plan view, where two walls cross over each other, I drew those as one, or I guess two walls that pass through. Ideally, that's not how it would be built. There'd be three walls in that condition. So that's ideally how we need to draw it. Since I drew them as one, I can come here to the erase menu and use part erase, and this will allow me to break one wall length into two on either side of the other partition. The vertical wall, I'll break it by clicking on opposite sides of the horizontal wall. And I now have three walls forming this intersection, one wall left to right, and two walls meeting it at the same point vertically. In this little area too, I want that to be a hallway. So I'm gonna break this other partition the same manner. Left click and left click, although in this case, it removes the partition partition between my two clicks. There's no other walls to join with. Next, we're going to add some openings. There's a number of predefined openings within the program. So from the draw menu, we come to openings. I'll start off by drawing some exterior doors, an entry door, door with two side lights. And we'll simply click to include where that opening needs to exist within the wall. Notice that I've left this dialog open because I can always refer to it to draw the next opening. I'll just position it up out of the way. I'll find a French door, a double French door next. We'll add this towards the back. Now with the double door, I can have it swing outward or swing inward, just depending on the closest side my cursor is relative to the wall. I want swinging in. So as long as my cursor is closer to the inside edge of the wall before I click, that's the direction the door will follow. For the interior doors, we'll try some panel doors. two foot six or 30 by 83 panel. For an interior door, same idea, we can indicate what direction the swing is in the room or outside the room, but we can also predict the hinge. In this case, the hinge is towards the top because my cursor is closer to the top corner. If I move my cursor down, 
it changes the swing direction or the hinge to be closer to the corner my cursor is closest to. I want the door to swing this way. Find that orientation and click. I'll use that same logic to add the others. Again, here I want this closet door to swing in the opposite direction. So as long as my cursor is close to the bottom corner before I click, that's the direction the door will swing in. I'm going to add a simple arch opening. It'll be between the back, front and back. In this case, it'll be a cased opening. So there'll be trim around it. And I'll place that there. The trim is indicated by the dotted red line you see around all these openings. That's a non-printing item, but it gives you the visual cue to understand that those openings have interior trim associated with them. I'm going to add a double panel door to this closet. And again, the same idea. We want to make sure it's swinging into the room. And finally, we'll add a series of windows. We'll try some double hungs. Forty-eight by forty-eight. I'll add one on either side of the front door. One into this room. One in this room. Here and here. And if we needed a different size window, again, we just come back to the dialog, find the other size and put it in place. I did forget to measure this room. I want that room actually to be 14 feet. And down, that was the right direction. So now I have my openings in place, back in 3D. We can see all the openings how they reside in their corresponding walls. To position the openings, if they need to be in a different location, first thing we do is we would edit their dimension. So if I needed this uh, door to be, let's say, 11 feet, the left mouse button or the left arrow would have moved the door. We can do that for any other openings. However, we can also set the openings by editing an opening and choosing center. This will allow the opening to be centered either within the inner length of the wall or outer. If it was the outer, it would center from the outside to corners. Ideally, in this case, we want it to be centered between the inside corners. That's the default. We'll say OK. And that's the location the window falls into. I can shortcut that by rather than editing the opening, I can right click on the opening. And when you right click on an object, there'll be a context sensitive dialog that opens, showing you several of the commands you can apply to that opening. In this case, we want it to be centered. Again, on the inner wall length, I'll do the same for this guy. For the openings towards the front, I can right click on the wall of which those openings are, and there's an option to equally space all the openings within that wall, either inner or outer. I'll choose outer in this case, and the space between these openings is now equal. If the outside dimensions need to be redrawn, there is a method of doing so automatically. From the dimension menu, there's an auto dimension tool. This will automatically add all dimensions and extensions to the outside. Since some already exist, there's a little warning message saying those current extensions and dimensions, those on the left and top, will be removed, but then they'll be replaced with new ones, as we've just seen there. Next, if I want to change how an opening looks, for example, this double door at the back, when I edit it, there's a display tab. And from here, I can change its hinge direction, how the door is going to be hinged. If I hover over it, you'll see this little bubble that indicates the values that are uh, expected. NR, we do this from the outside view. So NR means a uh, no hinge and a right hinge next to it. 
hit OK, and the door then conforms to those settings. If I edit the arch opening that I've put in place there, I want that to be a different size. The width and height are unavailable until I remove the product code designation. At that point, I can specify any size I require. Let's put that to four feet. I'll do the same for the window here at the front. I want this to be a six foot wide window. So I remove its product code and allows me to then enter the desired uh, width. I also want that to be a triple window. So I can come to the display, set the number of sections from two to three, so it's now a triple window. And like the door, though, we do need to indicate how that third side is to be hinged. In this case, to match the first two, it's an U for up. That will be apparent when we view it in an elevation view. And I can get a sample of how that's going to look by clicking on the elevation view in the edits preview down below. We now have arrows that indicate because it's a double hung, they both go up and down. If this size of window, this triple six foot wide window is going to be a window that you're gonna use often, be a good idea to have it in your library as a permanent opening to select from. So you don't have to continually modify other openings. To do so, once you have it set the way you want it, you can hit add product code. This adds that window into the current library. So I'll just give it a different name, 72 by 48, double hung three, hit OK. And if I now needed to draw that same window again, I can do so by coming to draw opening. And from the double hung window, it's now available as an opening that I can easily draw from. Since this is gonna be a basement, we do need stairs to go down into the basement. So I'm gonna draw those next. Draw menu, stair, and stair. This brings up a library, predefined stairs. I'll come to the straight library, 36 inch wide stairs, fine, hit okay. Should be noted that soft plan stairs by default go up. So if this was a two story home, I'd indicate where the stairs start and the direction of which they follow up. This is going to be a basement, but again, saw plan does have stairs defaulting going up. We can change that, but we have to follow that logic to offhand. Since this is going to be a basement, if this was the basement, I want my basement stairs to start approximately here. And then I move my cursor in the direction of up and click again. Back in 3D, Stairs are now drawn, but if we imagine this being a basement, that is correct. We want to start here and walk up to our main floor. Once we have a basement, we then can arrange each set of stairs to suit. If I want to position those stairs more accurately, I can do so without adding dimensions by using the set distance between tool under the dimension menu. I'll zoom in here and I can click on one side of the wall and the front edge of the stairs and it'll ask me for a value, three foot, nine inches. I'll hit the down arrow button to move the stairs and those temporary dimensions are removed. So we can position or place something accurately by adding temporary dimensions using the set distance between. Once we have the drawing at this stage, we do need to now account for the floor system. Softland has a series of what we call drawing modes. And the mode selector here is in the top right of my status bar, currently set to the default mode labeled drawing. If I need to draw a ceiling or a roof, or in our next case, a floor system, I switch the active mode to the corresponding mode, in this case, floor system. This redraws the floor plan in, in this case, a more simplified version. We've got dotted walls showing the location of the uh, walls, solid boxes for the opening locations. The dimensions have been removed. 
it's a less cluttered drawing so I can more accurately draw the elements of the floor system. Also notice that the draw menu has changed to reflect items that you draw for a floor system. From draw, I'll choose floor system and we'll go draw all these elements as once, but I'm gonna use manual trace. If I choose an auto trace, it would add a floor system that does indeed cover the entire main floor, but because we're gonna do a split, we need to have a separate floor system from the back to the front. So I'll do a manual trace and I'll trace within the thickness of the wall, each half of the building. Once these are drawn, the next task then is to position the back half one foot higher. Before I do that, I need to tell these two floor systems that they're going to be at different levels. And that is done by choosing the level tool in the draw menu. We then box in the floor system that is to be of a different level and set it to, in this case, level two. Now, once you've done that, and you are going to use levels, you'd want to come to Options and Visible Items, and here enable Show Joist Level. This will color code the joist items based on their level assignment, so you can clearly see one floor system level versus the other. Once that's done, I'm going to come back to my Edit tool. I'm going to locate a sill plate can find it through the letters here, SP for sill plate, and edit it, and give it a one foot offset up, hit OK, and then I'm going to do a cleanup. There are a number of ways to do a cleanup. You can find it in the toolbar, miscellaneous cleanup, or as indicated here with the, to the tooltip, Control C is the keyboard shortcut. So I'll hit Control C, and what the cleanup does, it tells all other joist items from level two to offset the same value as the ring, uh, sorry, the sill plate that I just edited. And it also tells the walls to offset to their corresponding floor systems. Back in 3D, we can now see that we do indeed have floor systems. Noticing that the walls towards the back are indeed on their floor system. It looks like the partitions at the front of the building are also on their floor system, but the two side walls, the exterior walls, they can only be on one floor system. So they've decided to go to the higher one. They're not referencing or sitting on top of the lower. Well, like we did with that interior partition, we need to break the exterior side walls into two wall lengths. So each wall can sit on their respective floor system. So back in main floor plan, We'll switch this back to drawing mode, erase, and party erase, and do the same thing. Click, click, and again, click on either side of the partition. Back in 3D, we can now also do a cleanup here, control C. This will recalculate those two sidewalls to find their respected floor systems. Okay. Next, we want the exterior walls all to have the same top plate position. Well, right now, the ones towards the back are a foot taller, given that they have a different floor system position, so we need to build the walls at the front of the house taller. Quick way to do so is to come to Edit and Set Wall Tops. This allows me to first click a wall whose top plate is properly set, which is one of the back walls. I can then click on each of the front house walls and they will automatically increase their height to match the top height of the first wall I selected. With that done, the openings towards the front, they maintain a equal distance from the top of the wall to the top of the window. Well, I want those windows to be flush to the top of the front door. So another tool, again, I'm doing this in 3D, is on the, the Move menu and Align Opening Tops. Works similar to the tool we just used for the walls. We first click on a source opening, in this case, the front door. That establishes a source. And then we click on the other windows, and they will adjust their position to be equal to the door I initially clicked on. I'll do the two on the side. The rest of the openings towards the back, they'll remain at their position, given that they're on that side of the building.
Next, well, we do now need to create our basement. Creating other drawings basically is a copy of the main floor. So we make a copy of the main floor and then we modify that copy to suit the layout of the other floor we're trying to represent. In this case for basements, there is an automated tool for that under the model menu called auto basement. Now we use the auto basement and it recognizes that you have no reference point. It will prompt you with this message suggesting that you do put one on here. Ideally, I'd say yes, which would allow me to add one, but I'm going to say no just to demonstrate why a reference point is so important. So without the reference point, it will still allow me to create the basement from this dialog. I can give it a different name, choose my basement wall types. There is no garage in this example, so we don't have to worry about those, and hit OK, and it does create our basement drawing. So again, to recap what the auto basement does, it makes a copy of the main floor, changes the exterior wall types into the basement wall types, and then erases the interior. It also sets the exterior openings to basement opening types. The other thing it does, it also includes it into the model category on the navigation. Meaning in 3D, I now have a basement. I can't quite see the basement. There's something called the auto horizon that's flowing through it. We can control where that auto horizon goes by clicking on options and setup options and dictating where that auto horizon is. We'll say six foot eight inches. Give me another foot. Next, well, just like the uh, main floor walls, we now have to give different heights to the basement walls towards the back to make up that foot difference between the bottoms of the main floor walls. So back in the main uh, basement drawing, I'll use my edit tool to edit a back wall and just increase it to nine feet. I want to make the same edit change to other like objects. I can use something called repeat edit. Edit, repeat edit, and I just click on the two sidewalls. Notice how they highlight, indicating that you've successfully done so, but also noticing the highlight, it's only the partial wall length. Again, because we broke the wall on the main floor into two wall lengths left and right, so is the basement. With that done, we can come to our 3D. We see now the basement walls are indeed one foot higher at the back, but the program is not stacking the two uh, floor plans together properly. This is the importance of the reference point. Without the reference point, the, sim the simple rule is the program takes the highest wall from the floor below and locates it to the lowest wall of the floor above. Adding a reference point tells the program which two walls to ideally stack on top of each other. So to add it from the main floor plan, I'll come to draw, reference and reference circle. Reference circle is the one that stacks buildings in 3D. I'll zoom up to the front corner and click to add it. I'll come to the basement, zoom up to the same corner and add it here too. So we're adding the re same reference point symbol, reference circle specifically, to the same corner of each drawing. Back in 3D, my floor plans are now properly assembled. Next, in my basement, there is indeed a stair there that goes up to the main floor, but there is no hole in the floor system. I can come to the main floor plan, switch to floor system mode, and I can draw a hole around here, but there is an automated tool that most people don't know about, is if you currently have your two floor plans set, you currently have your stairs drawn in the lower floor plan, and if you currently have the floor system established on the upper floor plan, you can edit the stair in the lower floor plan, and from the stair options tab, click on create framed hole. This will blow a hole through the floor system in the drawing that's assembled above it. Back in 3D, we now have a hole that we can see into the basement down the stairs. With that set, we really don't need stairs in the main floor that goes up to a non-existent second floor. So to take care of that, we don't want to erase the stairs. We need to see them from a plan point of view, but instead we can edit the stair. And from the common tab, 
remove it from extraction in the model. Simply take instead of the 3D view, it'll also remove it from any section view. And if we don't want to list in the material report, we exclude it in the same fashion. Remove the include in soft list from the soft list tab. Back in the main floor plan, if I switch it to drawing mode, I do now need to create a railing around the hole so I don't walk and fall through the hole. From the draw menu stair, there is a guardrail tool. This guardrail knows that it will not follow the uh, slope of the stair. It will stay flat on the floor plan. We'll choose the railing style. The colonial is fine. And I simply sketch the length of railing around where it needs to go. That railing is actually finding the edge of the hole in the floor system and sitting itself on the floor system, as we see here. So back in the main floor plan, yes, I did remove these stairs from showing in the 3D view, the extract and model, but they're still obviously shown here from a plan point of view. We need to show them in our construction document. However, I want to indicate the direction those stairs are following. So if I edit those stairs in the stair options tab, I can turn on total riser count and direction arrow, and we can see that it's going up 14 risers in this direction, which is wrong. They go down from the opposite end. Again, stairs and soft plan by default go up. Well, if you need them to go down, you do so by editing them and from the stair options tab, change the reference end. We want the top of this stair to be on this drawing. That just means then that the stairs must go down. That's all we need to do. Since a small part of that upper stair is on the opposite side of my railing, I want to hide this part of the stair that's under the railing. To do so, I can turn on a break. The break goes automatically halfway through the stair. I want to be set that at a custom position. Since these stairs do go down, it's a negative value. So I punch in minus seven feet, six inches, I believe it does it. And then I can either show the stairs below the break as dashed lines or hide them all together. In this case, I'll hide them all together. Now back in 3D, we don't quite see into the basement. We see the hole, but there's grass there. This is because the auto horizon is an infinite plane that basically goes through the building, but doesn't have the ability to be cut. If we want to accurately represent the site, we can do so by creating a site plan. To do so, I'm going to come back to the main floor plan, and I'm going to switch this drawing to site mode. A site plan ideally needs to be its own drawing, and we ideally start that drawing by accurately creating a building outline, ideally of the main floor. And the process of doing that is what I'm doing here, switching your main floor plan to site, and from site mode, going to draw, building outline, and generate building outline. This will ask me for a name of the drawing. I'll call it site plan. That does create it. I can then go ahead and add other elements, namely the property itself, row draw, site line, property, and sketch. And I'll sketch a perimeter of what I think the approximate size of the site will be. The site plan, again, is its own drawing. We see it here in the navigation, the site plans category. But in order to have that uh, portray in the 3D view, we need to add it to the model. So to do so, right click, add to model. The site plan should be the bottom drawing. It gets added to the top if it's already assembled. So we can right click on it and hit move to bottom. Back in 3D, the auto horizon now is removed and it gets replaced by the actual site plan. Next, well, we have to now position the building relative to the site itself and the method of doing so is back in site plan, clicking on site options, and now we can indicate the building's position. I'll say six foot eight, down, 
hit OK. And that is how the building is positioned within the site. And if I tilt my 3D camera up, we can now see down into the stairs. So the auto, uh, sorry, the actual site plan, or more specifically, the building outline of that site plan basically becomes a hole in the ground for which this house can sit into. If we want to slope our site, it's fairly simple to do so. Back in the site plan, ideally what we do is we first edit the corners of the property. So I'm gonna to come to my edit tool, click on a top corner, and I'll say that top corner's elevation is five feet. I'll continue editing the corners. The front we'll say is one foot down. Hit okay. I'll edit the opposite corner one foot down, you'll see that the program starts to predict what that elevation may be. Five feet up, that's perfect, hit OK. Back in 3D, I now have a sloped site. Simply from uh, minus one foot to the front to five feet plus towards the back. Now, if I want to control where the grade is around the house itself, I do something similar. I come back to the site plan and I now edit the corners of the building outline. Because there's two site objects below my cursor point, it needs to know what uh, site object it's going to affect. In this case, I want it to affect the property. And I want this to be one foot up towards the back. Hit OK. The opposite corner will also be affecting the property and be one feet up. Editing the front, again, affecting the property, we'll leave that at zero property, and zero. This then controls the elevations around the building's perimeter. Now, if you want to control the position of the building or the property within or, or not at a corner, you can do so by adding shot points. Grade shot point. I'll set the elevation to zero. Hit OK. And I'm going to turn on my cursor snap so I can accurately snap to the midpoint of the building. I'm also going to want to add a shot point on the outside property, left and right. Next, I'm going to edit the ones that are against the house because I want to make sure that, again, like the corners, there are two site objects at that location. I want this shot point to make sure it's affecting the property. Same thing with this guy, property. Now, the ones on the edge of the property have no choice because there's no other object. They are indeed affecting the property, but that allows me to control the site where there isn't a corner that I can edit. And the final thing we can do is back in the site plan, grade, grade. I'll try it as a spline. We can then draw sight lines within. Oops, undo. Ideally, to draw your grade lines, they should ideally start from the outside click on the edge of the property, that's why snap is on, and then you can click on a couple of points in the middle, but make sure you're clicking on the edge of the property again on the opposite side, and then a little bit beyond. A right click then will allow me to draw it. Let's say that's eight feet back in 3D, and we can now get that kind of a hill effect towards the back. Other site items, we can come to site work, driveway, draw it as an object, meaning it's going to be an even 10 feet wide. We'll align an edge. Start here. I'll move it towards the front. Again, my cursor snap is on, so I'm being accurate. I want that edge or the driveway to face the left, so I draw it to the left, click again. I can draw additional edges. I just want it to be straight, so I right-click, adds the driveway back in 3D. We can see the driveway in place. Now the driveway looks like it's floating towards the front because the driveway doesn't know what else to do. It goes basically at the zero offset. If I want it to find the grade, once the driveway is in place, I edit the driveway and hit fit site object to ground and it makes the driveway fit to the current location of the grade. We'll add a few other details to the front here. Let's come to the main floor plan. I left it off in site mode to generate the building outline. I'll switch now back to drawing mode. 
and I'll draw a simple deck around the front. I'll add some support beams to uh, help support a roof above it. And then I'll add some decorative posts at the corners. Now I'm doing all this with the cursor snap on. So it's placing at this point, the midpoint of the post to the corners of the deck, not exactly where I want them to go. I'm gonna come now to tool, or sorry, move and align to edge. This allows me to grab an alignment edge, in this case, the outside edge of the deck. And then I can move other items, in this case, the post and the beams to be in line with that edge. I've got all the front done. If I wanted to do the left and right, I first need to cancel the current alignment edge. So I hit the right mouse button, click on a new alignment edge, and then click again on the beam and the post. Right click to cancel, left click to indicate a new alignment edge, left click on the beam and left click on the post. This adds the posts to it. The posts don't quite hit the beam. We can edit those posts. And from the edit dialog, adjust height to fit the beam. I'll do the same to the other. We'll then come to draw, roof, and auto roof. Sopline has a number of roof tools. An auto roof simply takes takes a look at the current perimeter of the building and creates a roof for it. To modify the roof two ways, we can edit the middle of the roof. This will affect properties that affect the entire roof as a whole. So I can give it a seven inch pitch, a little bit steeper, or I can change the overhang and it will affect the roof as a whole. If I want to change individual edges, I can do so by editing edges of the roof. And if we're doing it in 3D, we click on the eave edge and let's set this style to something called a Dutch gable. This will be part gable, part hip. I'm going to set that back to about, I think, seven feet, just so we can get a Dutch gable beyond the front hip that we have. I'll use repeat edit and click on the back to give me the same style of a Dutch gable at the back towards the front, back to my edit tool, I'll edit the front edge, I can make that a gable. So if we need to change styles of roof, we edit edges. In this case, we can fancy it up again a little bit by turning off the gable end provided by roof, and I'll turn on an accent truss. The beam that is now there, although it's required to help support the roof and tell the program where the accent truss is, that's where it's referencing we don't really need to see the beam in 3D. So I can like the stairs, edit that beam, and from the common tab, just remove it from extraction in the model. And same with soft list. Elevations and sections, they're already drawn. We just have to view them. I can double click on the front view and this will indeed produce an elevation. From here, I can if necessary, change things. So we notice we don't need windows in the basement. I can erase them from this point of view, click, click, and it will erase it from all aspects. So from my basement drawing, they're no longer towards the front in 3D as well, they have been removed. If I need to detail out my elevation, I can do so by switching it to what we call annotated mode. This draws off the, off the bat here, we get some elevate, uh, sorry, uh, roof pitch indicators, the hinge indicators for the doors and the openings, and the elevation uh, markers left and right. If I need to add additional information to it, I can certainly draft notes, speed notes, for example. I can indicate asphalt shingles and other notes to indicate finishes within the uh, drawing. Finish grade, although it's already there, horizontal siding perhaps. And that finishes out my elevation views. If there was a change to the drawing, the automatic elevations would update right away. For example, if I come back to, oops, let's go to 3D. Let's edit the front edge of my roof again and change the distance. And that distance of a Dutch gable is the run of the first pitch. If I set that to six, it makes the gable a little bigger back in my south elevation. That has updated to show me the accurate Dutch gable. 
Section views are similarly created, but we first come to the main floor plan and we indicate where that section is going to be cut. We need to draw a cut line, in other words. To do so, model and section line. To draw the section line, click outside the building, all the way through, click again. And then if you want to look at the left, you click towards the left and you get this backwards C-shaped section line. So three clicks to indicate where you're cutting and the view direction. Once you have a section letter drawn, you'll see it on the navigation and there's cross-section views. You can double click on that and it will generate the section view in as much as the elevations. And you can also set that to an annotated to fill out details, add notes and other elements to make it more accurate. What we see here in the basement though is it's a small thing, but the stairs are not quite hitting the top. So we can edit the stair and correct that mistake. So once you start generating elevations and sections, you may discover certain things are not quite right. You have the ability then to modify those things. Modifying it from one aspect does indeed carry that same change all the way through to all other aspects of the building. In the main floor plan, I'm gonna quickly add a little kitchen layout here just to show you some of the tools. First of all, we draw a series of symbols, in this case, refrigerator and stove. I'll come to a kitchen appliances, scroll down a bit. Let's get to a range. We'll draw a range here. And a refrigerator. To add the cabinets themselves, we can draw it manually, but if you wanted to do this quick, there is an auto cabinet tool, and I'll draw the uppers and the lowers all at once. Hit OK, and what I do is basically trace along the back edge of where I want the cabinets to exist. And I right click to cancel. Now, since my uh, appliances were already in place, the cabinets are ignoring the appliances and going around them. Also because of my window, the uppers, as you can see from the dotted lines, are ignoring the upper windows. If we wanted to get an interior elevation on that, interior elevation from the model menu allows me to pick a point and a view direction and it will view that interior elevation. It does go all the way from wall to wall and if I want to change the length of that, I can do so by going to an adjust item tool and then grabbing the end of that and putting it up at the end of the cabinetry. And then like the section before it, that view is now found in the interior elevation views category in the navigation to double click on it produces that interior elevation. Back in the main floor plan, if you want to quickly lay out perhaps some furniture, I'm going to come to, uh, again, symbols, go to furniture and beds. We can add individual symbols per the room, but a quick way to lay out all your furniture is to come to the interior decor, uh, decor library and assembled symbols. This will give us a series of symbols that are predefined or pre-orientated and we can simply click where those go. And in this case, it's adding, for example, a couch, a chair, and a table. Now, if I want to change the arrangement of those, for example, let's move the chair, you'll discover that as soon as I grab the chair, oops, I gotta get to the move command. So move command, I can grab that chair, but it's gonna move all three at once because that's how they were added. If I want to have the ability to move the chair separate from the couch and table, right click on these grouping of symbols and hit explode item. This changes them into individual symbols. So now I can come to move and move that chair at will. However, if I want to rotate, adjust, and move the stair all, or chair all at once, coming to move and modify is the tool of choice. This allows me then to, based off of the style of icon, in this case, that red arrow indicates a rotate. I click and I can rotate the chair. That indicates a move. So all I gotta do is move the stair or chair 
where I need it to go. If I want to stretch the chair, adjust it, coming to the edge, and I can adjust it. That is all done with the modify tool. I can rotate, move, and adjust all with one tool. Next thing I want to quickly go over is the ability to hide these this furniture layout um, by coming to options and visible items. I can turn off symbols as such, but that also turns off the display of my appliances in the kitchen. So I don't want to turn off the display of symbols. So back under visible items, we'll turn the symbols back on. In other words, I need to control the visibility of these symbols separately from these symbols. That is done by now assigning it layers. So first we're gonna come up to model, or sorry, options and layer setup. I'm gonna take layer one and relabel it to furniture and hit okay. I can now edit the furniture and from the common tab, place it on that layer. I'll use edit and repeat edit to grab the other furnitures, but not apply that to the appliances. If I want to see the furniture, I can still do so by coming to my default layer button, which brings up this, and I can make that layer visible. There they are. Now the difference here with the layer is that although I don't see it in 2D, they're still being represented in a 3D view. So that's how layers work. We can assign something to a layer and control its 2D visibility. Supplin also has something called building options, which works similar to that of layers, but has the benefit of also controlling 3D visibility. Well, let's set one up. I'm gonna to come to model and building options. This is where we configure them. I'm going to add something called a radio group. What a radio group does is it allows me to have two choices and it will either be choice A or choice B. One, while one is on, the other is automatically off. I'll add two options to it and relabel them. One would be, for example, a twin window, and this will be for a triple window. So what we're gonna do is at the front, we'll have a triple window as one option and a twin as the other. And even relabel the group, that might be a good idea as well. We'll call that windows. Okay, with that established, I'm going to now edit the front triple window, come to the common tab, hit assign building options, remove it from the default and add it to the triple window. It's removed. I'm going to now copy the other twin that's on the opposite side, place it where it needs to go, edit that copy, and put it on the twin window building option. The twin building option is currently visible. If we come to the building option button at the top, we can then control which one is going to be visible. If I hit the triple, the triple is shown. Now the benefit here is that with the triple shown, it's also updating the elevation, 3D, and the material report. If I look for windows here, we have the triple window, 72 by 48, double hung, and uh, where's this, 48, five of the 48. Whereas if I come back to my plan view and switch it back to the twin, all aspects of the design are gonna update to show you that particular building option. Elevations, they're gonna update, and my material report is also updating. So that's the main difference between a building option and a layer. Okay, so I squeezed a lot of information in there in a short amount of time. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. So thank you for joining me today. Um, realize that I did go quite fast. We are going to, or this session has been recorded. So we will post it on our YouTube channel so you can review it at a later time. 
But I do thank you for joining me today, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.